We're going to try this and see how it is. Now, those of you in back, if I start to fade or I get too loud or not loud enough, raise your hand and point up or point down. How's this? Are we okay? Wonderful. Well, Jim, I haven't heard the whistle yet. I haven't heard the whistle. There we go. Now we can start. Now we can start. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, those of you that uh, came from out of town, welcome to Indian Summer. Excuse me. What's the word I want? Indian Spring? Spring squalls. And you know, we all love this weather because we know what's coming. So our friends from Texas who came up and didn't realize there were mountains there yesterday when they landed in Denver and came up to Cheyenne, tomorrow they're going to see some beautiful snow-capped mountains on their way back to Denver. Because we know within a couple of days it's going to be 60, 70, and 80 degrees here in Cheyenne, Laramie, along the front range of Colorado. Uh, we enjoy this weather very much. Well, my name is Al Dunton. I'm serving as moderator because when Jim found out about this uh, award uh, a few months ago, he thought about it a while, and then he told me about it, and he said, Al, if uh, we were able to do anything, any kind of a presentation, I would like you to serve as moderator. And I said I would be delighted to. Well, one thing led to another. The railroad, railroad, excuse me, Railway and Locomotive Historical Society, the head of the awards committee who was originally from North Platte, he was going to try and come out, that didn't work out. A couple of others were going to try and come out. We're blessed that Bob and his wife Peggy Holsweiss from Bryan, Texas, he, Bob is the president of the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society, decided to come up to make the official presentation and we're just absolutely delighted. So welcome to all of you. Jim will welcome you again later. Also, we want to thank very much Ed Dickens for volunteering this facility. And you realize where you're sitting was all kinds of machinery and equipment and other stuff just a few days ago. So we're delighted that uh, we're able to have this facility. So Ed, if you would like to welcome us, we're able to do that. Thank you, Al. Well, on behalf of the Union Pacific Railroad, I'd like to welcome you here to this over 100-year-old facility. And a question that I, I just can't help but ask the crowd when we gather like this is, how many of you thought that you would see a big boy locomotive in person ready to go out and serve as a great public relations ambassador? And I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about Jim Ehrberger. Jim started, Jim came into this building here, I think in 1953 at the age of 16. He's told me this story many times. Back when the roundhouse was actually 360 degrees, or nearly so, and this building was twice its size. Jim, as a young crew caller, 
Uh, they called him a crew caller back then. Uh, he would make his rounds through here, and he began taking pictures. I've known Jim over 36 years. He was a good friend and business partner with my mentor and very best friend, dear friend, Ed Gerlitz. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to have Jim here today and to recognize him for all of his great preservation efforts. And it's a joy seeing everyone here where we can, we can uh, take a few minutes and, and think about all the great things Jim has done. Lots of memories, lots of photographs that guys like me, when I was a younger person, read Jim's books and looked at his photographs of years prior to when I was even born. So it's just a, a real honor and a privilege to have you here, Jim. And uh, another quick part of that story. So Jim would walk in the roundhouse over there, and this building was actually connected to that roundhouse, and he would make his rounds before before an era that we're familiar with today when you can't just walk into a railroad facility. Well, they knew Jim, and they would probably see him daily walking through there, and he would make his way through the door and through a series of other doors, and they had a little pop machine over here. As he tells me the story, they had different flavors of soda. And so he would make it a point, where were they, nickel? Probably a nickel. So he would pop the, the lid on his soda can and begin walking through the shop. The 17 bays here where they did heavy rebuilds, specifically of the steam locomotive. When the big boys got here, they were, they were too big. They actually had to cut the back of the cab off. So when we got the big boy from Pomona, from the Rail Giants Museum, from the Southern California chapter of the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society, it still had that Frankenstein connection on the back of the cab. So enjoy yourselves, and uh, with that, I'll give it back to Al. Thank you, Ed. Well, we're here to celebrate railroad history. And as Ed just said, what better example of preservation of railroad history is how many years, Ed, 10 years that you've been working uh, when you started this dream? You had the dream before that, but uh, active work on it, almost 10 years. 13 years, okay. Well, Mr. Ehrenberger, who we are honoring for his contributions to railroad history preservation, uh, as I said, asked me to serve as moderator, and I am absolutely delighted to do that. Why me? Well, Jim and I have had a business relationship for over many years. My wife, Lynn, and I own and operate Centennial Publications, which started in 1976, which was the centennial year of Colorado statehood, and uh, we were going to publish railroad books, Colorado history, mining history, uh, nonfiction, biographies, all kinds of things. We did a few books and realized there was no way we were going to make a living doing that. It was very fortunate, two men. I'm looking at Paul Hammond, and he knows his predecessors. And by the late 70s, Bob Richardson at the Railroad Museum, who the Railroad Museum was obviously one of our largest customers for the books that we published, uh, as I would ask him questions and try to uh, feel out his background and knowledge of how to sell books, how to distribute books, he said to me one day, Al, oh, well, I like what you're doing. Why don't you distribute our books? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you have customers all over the country. And one of the unpleasant jobs that Bob had in the 1970s was shipping books. And uh, he was, uh, for a lot of that time, the only paid employee and relying on volunteers. And uh, so this relieved him of some of that. That relationship continues to this day. And I look around this room because Paul Hammond, raise your hand, the executive director of the Colorado Railroad Museum. The Railroad Museum is still one of my largest suppliers of books that we sell wholesale. In other words, we're wholesale. We don't sell retail. We sell to other dealers all over the country. And the Railroad Museum is still one of our largest customers. This audience is such a delight to see. Several of our current former 
publishers that we distributed their books are represented here, and some of our customers like Paul at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Where's Donna Arnold down at the uh, gift shop at the Depot Museum downtown? So that relationship has been a business relationship. But it quickly turned into a personal relationship in the sense that Jim has always enjoyed sharing his knowledge, his background, the materials he's collected, his photographs. How many of you in your career with a lot of the organizations that are listed here in the program or in your own research, there are authors here that have utilized Jim's resources, his photographs, his knowledge. Other organizations that uh, are not represented here. How many of you have taken advantage of that sometime in the past, of getting information, photographs from Jim for all of your endeavors? Show your hands. It's darn near everybody. So it's uh, uh, the award we are talking about is the Gerald M. Best Senior Achievement Award in Railroad History from the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society. When Jim told me about this, I said, what does that mean? They finally figure you're old enough to get this real award? Well, he is, but it's much more than that. Folks, this is a big deal. And I've told several people that this is the major award in the country in railroad history and the preservation of that history. And so what more fitting person than Jim Ehrenberger? This particular program is for Jim a celebration and a recognition of lifelong friendships with many of you. And this program is for all of you. And here's why. Most of you had no idea when you look at these organizations and the things I'm going to talk about, what Jim has been involved with in the last almost 72 years in terms of railroad history. This is an opportunity for him to honor each of you, for you to see Jim in a much broader light than whatever your relationship has been with him. And uh, so he made sure that uh, I mentioned that, that this program is for all of you and a way to thank each and every one of you. Well, the handout we worked on for the last two or three weeks, we had no idea that uh, uh, Bob Holsweiss, the president, would be able to attend to make the formal presentation. For a while, I thought I was going to do it. And uh, I was just delighted when Bob said, no, he'll come up and, and do that. Uh, what an honor. So this handout serves as an outline serves a variety of purposes. It serves as a press release. Those of you that want to go back to your organization, many of you have newsletters, bulletins, magazines, things with the various organizations that you belong to. You're welcome to use any or all of it. You're welcome to use any or all of the information here. And of course, you all know that Jim responds quickly to emails, which is his preferred method of communication. And uh, if there's any other information that you would like to have, you can, you can get it. Now, I'm going to step on Bob's toes here a little bit with this first paragraph. In terms of the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society, it was founded in 1921 and is the oldest organization in North America, which promotes research and encourage, encourages preservation of documentation and photographs of railroading the business history, the finance, the labor history, the biography, the technology of railroad, all of these various activities. An awards program recognizes those who make outstanding contributions in such pursuits. Most significant of the awards, folks, this is a major award as far as I'm concerned, the major award. One of the most significant is the Gerald M. Best Senior Achievement Award, named in honor of noted historian, photographer, and author Jerry Best, 
generally bestowed annually, not always, for significant and long-standing contributions to the writing, preservation, and interpretation of railroad history. Think about those words. The writing, preservation, and interpretation. And you'll see as we go through the rest of the information here how that applies to Jim. It is fitting that Jim Ehrenberger is being recognized with this award. The RNLHS makes almost annually, usually what, six awards, seven now, six. This is the most significant and the most important. And the society takes this very, very seriously. This is not the whim of one person. There were, he was nominated by multiple people, both within and without the organization for this award, without Jim's knowledge. Then this awards committee basically consulted with at least 10 of the people, in some cases, of some individuals talked to others, but there were 10 who actually submitted information about Jim on which the committee to make its decision. Uh, I have not asked, I don't know if the vote was unanimous, but uh, the committee decided to award this award to Jim. And this is why it is so significant. This is the major award. Well, Jim's involvement with railroad history began over 70 years ago. He was a teenager in the early 1950s, grew up in a farm north of Omaha, moved the family to Bushnell, Nebraska, which is just across the Wyoming, uh, Nebraska border, just a few miles east of here, a very small town on the main line of the UP, and then to Cheyenne. Uh, where he was in high school, had a camera, was taking pictures, and uh, where are the information uh, about some of those? Well, I'm holding up the current issue of the Streamliner magazine, which is the quarterly magazine of the Union Pacific Historical Society. And this current issue, uh, timing couldn't have been better. Uh, I have been basically for almost 20 years been pumping Jim on things that he did and trying to document some of them in terms of his activities in his life. And so what he talks about in this issue is a beautiful eight-page article that describes his 35-year railroad career, which started uh, in uh, 1850s. I, no, I'm not that old. 1953. Not quite that old. He's old, but not quite that old. But before that, he was taking pictures with a, uh, a camera. And uh, what he was doing was trying to document the last days of steam on the local railroads, which were the Union Pacific, of course. The Colorado and Southern Standard Gauge, this is the Northern Division from Denver up through Boulder, Fort Collins, here to Cheyenne, further north in Wyoming and the Burlington Railroad, represented here in Cheyenne by the High Line. The Sterling, Colorado to Cheyenne Branch Line, which was still under steam. And those were the three local railroads that he began documenting. He quickly fell in love, not only with steam, but with narrow gauge. And little known fact, you're all going to learn something about Jim today that you didn't know before. He is one of the experts on Colorado narrow gauge, especially the Rio Grande and the Rio Grande Southern. And back on the table, you will see two of the books that he wrote and published himself on the Rio Grande Southern, plus another little known fact. He was the co-author on volume 12 of Sundance's Rio Grande Southern story series, the huge 12 books, four to 500 pages on the Rio Grande Southern. Why? Because from day one, Jim not only photographed, but he documented the various activities that he saw and kept records and collected records and had all kinds of information about all these railroads that often was just thrown away. Jim collected it. And yes, he had uh, 
storage areas in uh, his houses and <laughs> other places. But uh, he began by documenting this steam. This quickly expanded because the rail fan community at that time nationwide was fairly interconnected and indeed did trade photographs, trade negatives, things like that. When we talk about capturing images or capturing views, you all understand that at that time Jim was shooting black and white and creating a negative of which he would have prints made, or sometimes multiple prints, and keeping the information on each of his images or photographs. He started collecting other photographers, now historic views of railroad operations, primarily in the West, but all over the country. The accumulation of other photographers' work continues to this day and now forms the majority of his collection. We'll talk about that in just a moment. He also photographed railroads, primarily steam, in 16 foreign countries, some multiple times, and this is part of his collection. Over the last 25 years, it started in 1999, when he started working with the University of Wyoming and Laramie through their foundation, and then the establishment of the American Heter Heritage Center at the University of Wyoming. To ensure that these views are accessible to future historians, researchers, and modelers, pause a little aside. Yes, all you modelers know that Jim has been a long-time source of information. And many of the books he's published of plans, of structures, of other things on the Union Pacific primarily, with some of the other uh, topics that he's published books on. Well, this collection is available to anybody who wants to use it, and through the University of Wyoming, and it's being extensively used now. Well, this collection is now over 100,000 negatives, black and white negatives, obviously different sizes, Jim has no idea exactly how many. One day when the AHC, the American Heritage Center, gets everything cataloged and digitized, they're going to press the button and it's going to say exactly how many they are. Jim's best guess is about 105, maybe 106,000 negatives. And also gifted is over 50,000 photographs. So obviously there are negatives in the collection that never were printed as photographs or he never kept one. And it works the other way. There are photographs that he did not have the negative for, sometimes coming from another photographer. But all of this is being digitized and is being made available to researchers of all kinds. This collection has been gifted very important word, it has been endowed. Jim has endowed the American Heritage Center through the University of Wyoming Foundation to work this collection, to digitize it, to make it available, to store it, all the things that you think of. And what most people don't realize, this list of organizations on here that Jim belongs to or has been associated with, he has gifted, both in terms of objects, duplicates of his photographs, other items in his collection. Sometimes there would be duplicate negatives, especially all of you that took slides or transparencies and you were trading with somebody else, what did you do? You'd get a nice picture, so you'd take three or four of them so you could trade with somebody else. Sometimes the photographers did that with negatives, too. So. This collection of over 100,000 negatives, 50,000 uh, black and white photographs, and several thousand color transparencies has not only been gifted but endowed to the American Heritage Center. Also included are thousands and thousands of other items, primarily railroad-produced publications, manuals, rule books, public employee timetables, uh, maps, 
plans, many other types of things, not hardware. Uh, he has already donated to other museums and other organizations some of the hardware that he has disposed of over the years. In some cases, he obviously sold some of it off. But these are the items that are suitable for research. So his files are going to Laramie. A lot of them are already there. This gifting has been going on for years. And by files, this is very important to understand. He has multiple filing cabinets full of individual files about a specific such a subject. Wrecks on such and such, snow operations, snow sheds, plans of this and that and the other thing. Research files, so when he does a book or somebody asks him a question or requests information, he can go to one of these files and find information. His memory is fantastic. Remember, he's a little older than I am, and I'm just in awe of his memory because mine is, is nowhere near as good as Jim's. But uh, these items are available for research. Uh, this is all either in or going to Laramie to the American Heritage Center. In other words, this work is still ongoing. Well, Jim's career with the Union Pacific from 1953 to 1988 is covered in detail in this issue of the Streamliner. And there's a little overlap in terms of some of the information of getting involved with the railroad preservation, photography, etc. But uh, if you uh, do not have a copy or don't get a copy of this, uh, Mr. John Kazan, who is here, raise your hand. John, who is the treasurer, he's a director and the treasurer of the UP Historical Society, lives here in town and is the office manager of the UPH office here in town. And he would be happy to sell you another copy of this, whether you're a member or not. But uh, by all means, get a hold of a copy of this Streamliner. Because this career consisted of over 40 different positions, all the way from callboy, in other words, a crew caller to begin with, to a crew dispatcher, actually assigning individuals to various jobs, worked in to, to the secretary, the superintendent of the Wyoming division of the Union Pacific, traveled with him as his secretary in his private car for many years. And uh, uh, Jim was very fortunate. He was never in train service in terms of an engineer, conductor, brakeman, having to be away from home on most jobs, going out somewhere, staying overnight, and come back. He liked to be at home. And yet, he ended up in this career of over 40 different positions, uh, from crew dispatcher, secretary of the superintendent, eventually a train dispatcher. His last job was as the manager of rules and safety for the Union Pacific. And that's the job he retired from in 1988. Well, in this article, it details a lot of these other positions. And what Jim ended up with, and when I realized this in the late 80s after he retired, I said, my God, Jim, you know more about operating this railroad than virtually any other single individual because you've worked all the variety of clerical jobs. Everybody knows the glory of what we love to photograph is this, the steam locomotive, modern diesels, etc. But a railroad ran and to a certain extent, extent still does on paperwork. So these were primarily clerical jobs. Now often in a large office, there would be this desk that handles demurrage, uh, this one that handles something else, and he would work different jobs. All of those clerical jobs were union jobs, and they were, had specific rates of pay and specific duties for what he was doing. So he ended up touching on many aspects of the railroad that many individuals did, never did. Well. The final job of manager of rules of safety in the 1980s, and he has a back on the display table a 
little globe that has a timetable in it. He produced the system timetables for the entire Union Pacific Railroad in the 1980s, and uh, these are obviously collector's items now. Well, this work for the UP, plus his own extensive research, provided information to author, co-author, compile and produce almost 70 books and dozens and dozens of articles that often were illustrated with his own photographs or material from his collection. Jim did something from the start. He found somebody good to partner with, and many of his books, as you'll see examples back on the table, he has co-authors, and some of them are here today. He is regularly cited and credited for information and images by other author and editors from the first photos of Trains Magazine in 1955, to several books by Lucius Beebe, to photos appearing yet today in all types of publications. Back on the table, be sure to look at the 1955 issue of Trains Magazine, which has the first two photographs that Jim had published in a magazine. After those articles were published, one day he got a phone call from a man by the name of Lucius Beebe, who was so impressed with these photographs, he said, oh, do you have other photographs, other information? They established a relationship, a correspondence relationship. Um, one time when Jim was in San Francisco, this is a wonderful story, I'd ask him sometime that he, Lucius Beebe took him to lunch. And uh, he said, you know, you walked into that restaurant and it was obvious who this ostentatious individual was. Uh, Lucius Beebe was every bit as ostentatious as his reputation uh, which preceded him. But mostly, Beebe's books are either his and or his partner Charles Clegg's photographs. Jim was one of the ones that work appeared in several of Mr. Beebe's books. Well, he has been a sought-out speaker, presenter, consulted on railroad history, has appeared on radio, television, and videos, including PBS, both locally and regionally, the BBC, and in Germany. And on the table back there is an article from a German magazine. They invited Jim over, interviewed him, produced a video, produced this magazine on big boys. Why is Jim the expert on big boys? Because in the 1950s, he photographed in his last days of steam all 25 of the operating big boys. And of course, the first time Ed is here running, breaking it in, testing it a little bit, there's Jim at trackside photographing 4014. There's only a handful of people that can make that claim of actually photographing big boys in service and now for photographing 4014. Well, be sure to look at the material back on those tables. Uh, this will prompt some of the other stories as you talk to Jim in the future. Well, I mentioned that uh, Jim authored and co-authored and he began documenting in the 50s the last days of steam. In 1965, Jim formed E&G Publications with his good friend Francis Gushwind from Callaway, Nebraska, to publish their books on Union Pacific and Colorado and Southern Standard Gauge, The Last Days of Steam, of what they had been photographing in the 50s into the early 60s. So, the, this publishing lasted until the 1980s when Francis retired and Jim created Challenger Press, which he only disbanded just, what, a year ago, two years ago, that you, was it before COVID? Oh, okay, he disbanded it. But you didn't turn in your sales tax license, you told me, until just uh, two years ago. That was so that if something came up that he wanted to do, he could still do that. 
So, what this did is lead to publishing more of his own books, often with a partner or a co-author. Many of these books that he produced, you don't find him as author, but it might say somewhere edited by Jim Ehrenberg or information from Jim Ehrenberg. In other words, he reprinted a lot of information from the UP with various other publishers, that and himself as both Ian G and his challenger, where there are books that he produced even though he is not technically listed as author. Well, I told him you should have put yourself as author care how this came about. No, you didn't do writing. You were uh, basically uh, republishing or using uh, existing material, but it allowed you to produce another book. So this, uh, this publishing led to others publishing Jim's books, starting with the Intermountain Chapter of the National Railway Historical Society. The Union Pacific Historical Society, Society has published the majority of Jim's 70 books. Centennial Publications, Lynn and I, we did a softbound revised edition of Jim's book on Sherman Hill, which he went through two hardbound editions. It's back on the table. And he said, Al, why don't you uh, publish a softbound of this so that it's a little lower price point? And he revised it to bring it up to date at that time. So we did that. He also uh, produced books for Sundance Publications. I mentioned him being a co-author on Rio Grande Southern Story, Volume 12. Withers Publishing, he and his good friend Jack Wolf. There's a copy of it back there on the facilities of Cheyenne. That was the last major hardbound book that he did. So, a wide variety of organizations. He has had hundreds of his images used, not only in his, but other authors' work in books, magazines, newspapers, journals, newsletters, and of course now online. You can find many of Jim image, Jim's images online. To illustrate his and others' works, he often partnered with no noted railroad artists and illustrators, and most of them very good friends, including Howard Fogg. Now, why would Jim, here in Cheyenne, and Howard Fogg in Boulder become fast friends in the 1950s? What were they doing? Those of you that knew Howard or his background, Howard grew up on the Northern Division, or excuse me, he lived in Boulder on the Northern Division of the Colorado and Southern. And so they became fast friends, uh, often excursions, things of that sort, photographing. Howard, uh, you may not be aware, uh, his thing was not photography as much as it was sound. He even produced several recordings, records of steam locomotives, primarily CNS standard gauge and Union Pacific. So he worked with artists like Howard. He also worked with Otto Kuehler, Harlan Heine, Bob Jensen, uh, in one of his books, and it's back there, John Coker, Jeff Ellington on the two Rio Grande Southern books that are back there, and of course, Gil Bennett. Gil Bennett is the premier railroad artist, uh, still working today, and uh, Jim has some of Gil's paintings. Uh, Gil still consults Jim on his things when uh, he's doing a very specific painting or wants detail on something. Where can I find this information or the photograph? That's the man. If he doesn't have it in his collection, he knows where it is. So, this work in publishing is much more than just his own two publishing companies. Well, on May 17th in 1953, on the very first Rocky Mountain Railroad Club excursion on the Union Pacific, up to that time they had done excursions on the narrow gauge, or the railroads in and out of Denver, uh, both standard gauge and then the narrow gauges in the mountains, primarily Rio Grande or Rio Grande Southern. Jim was too late for the Rio Grande Southern excursions from the Rocky Club. But on this excursion between Denver and Laramie, where they used Challenger 3967, and that engine was recreated several years ago when 
the steam crew at that time, its predecessors, put on the elephant ears and painted it the way it was when it operated on the very first Rocky Mountain Railroad Club excursion on the UP. Jim was intimately involved with that. Well, on that excursion, he met very famous authors like Otto Perry and Dick Kendi, Richard Kendi. became very close friends, especially with Richard. Uh, Otto died in the early 70s. Um, these, this is what led to his collecting other photographers' photographs and images and negatives, etc. On that excursion, he met several other now well-known authors, uh, excuse me, photographers. This led to immediate membership in the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club and multiple stints as president, director, even biz, uh, excuse me, other offices over the decades, was involved with excursions, et cetera. And here's Jim. When asked, took on another job. He's a newly elected director again for the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club. Well, he served as president, director, and business manager of the Union Pacific Historical Society. He was the first business manager when the office was uh, established here. Mary Nystrom, who's here, was the second business manager. She got involved with the excursions with her husband, Lynn. Uh, then it went to Bob Krieger for many, many years until his passing. Uh, what's it been, Jim? About a year and a half that Bob passed away. And uh, now to John Kazin, who is the business manager of the UPHS. And so, Jim, the point I'm making with all these organizations, wasn't just a member. He always participated. He became a be benefactor. He donated to them, etc. He's a life member of the Colorado Railroad Museum and supports a lot of its, its activities over the decades. He maintains membership in a dozen, dozen other railroad historical organizations. Too many to list, but all that he does more than just be a member, he supports them and promotes them. Good examples, the Burlington Historical Society, the Chicago Northwestern Historical Society, major donors to all their fundraising activity. They're building uh, headquarters building the uh, Burlington in uh, Baraboo, Wisconsin, the Chicago Northwestern at the Illinois Railway Museum and Union, major supporters, down to some of the tiny ones, like the Gallup and Goose Historical Society in Dolores, Colorado the Ridgeway Railway Museum in Ridgeway. Each of them are involved with RGS geese, and the geese are one of Jim's things that he enjoys very, very much. So, gives you an example of the types of things that he has done. Now, unknown to most of you in the rail fan community, as you see here in this list, among his many non-railroad organizations, he's a charter member and active supporter of the Wyoming Historical Society. Notice I said charter member. That's been a few years. He's been an honored volunteer at the Wyoming State Museum. Well, what does that mean? Well, for a few years, he was volunteer of the year. Who did the most? Who volunteered the most hours? Michelle at the Colorado Model Railroad Museum is familiar with this. You honor your volunteer walk into a museum and there's a list and, uh, of what they did and for how long, okay? Well, he's worked with the Cheyenne Downtown Bronze Project and many of you are aware of this and the mayor unfortunately had to go out of town and where I first met the mayor was at the UPHS convention two years ago when Jim was honored by the mayor for his support of this bronze project. What started as a downtown civic project to create bronzes with local artists from the depot up the street, which is Capitol Avenue, to the Wyoming State Capitol. We expanded, and now it's all over downtown. And Jim's, some of you have seen, but the next time you're down at the depot, going to the wonderful museum there that Jim has supported over the years.
across the street in front of the restaurant and lounge that is there, the Albany, is Jim's contribution, which is a wonderful bronze of an engineer and a conductor, a steam engineer, obviously, synchronizing their watches. And part of the display explains how the railroads were really the entity that forced the standardization of time in this country, the establishment of the four time zones in the continental United States, the necessity for having uh, time zones, many of you were before that, Every place, basically, the local time was wherever noon, where the sun was directly above that location. Location that was noon. Well, 100 miles down the track, one way or the other, it was 10 minutes different because the sun hadn't gotten that far yet. Well, Jim is a honored, honored con contributor to that, and of course, he is a life member of the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society. How many of you are RNLH members, RNLHS members here? Several. And Jim, you can hold your hand up too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, those who know Jim appreciate his consistent willingness to accurately and graciously answer questions and provide insight into the details, the nuances of railroad history, about the only thing he refuses to do is when a modeler asks how many rivets or what was the size or spacing on the side of that car locomotive, he refuses to get down to that level of detail. But that's about the only thing that he either knows or he knows where to find it. And he will tell modelers who ask those questions where to go. You know what I mean. He provides valuable assistance to the American Heritage Center at the university, questions about the collection, methods of research, where to find things. Here he's donated all this stuff the last several years. He still, when he's doing research on something, has to go to Cheyenne and find it. But he knows right where it is because everything he gave them, he inventoried and documented down to the hundreds and hundreds of boxes that have been given to them where exactly it is as they work those boxes and digitize the information, scan it, etc., then he can access it that way. But if they haven't gotten to that box yet, he knows right where it is. If he needs to find for his current book project, he had to go over there and access some of the public timetables of the UP because his current project with his Co-author, Mark Entz, who unfortunately couldn't be here. Mark is the recent retired editor of the Streamliner for the UPHS. This is his major hardbound book on the motor cars of the Union Pacific, due out later this year. We're all breathlessly awaiting it. This has been a several year project, and uh, it also ends up as a kind of a history of the McKee Motor Car Company, which uh, of course Mr. McKean worked for the UP and they shared facilities in Omaha when McKean got started. Well, all of this activity, in every respect, Jim demonstrates the qualities, the achievements, which make him a most deserving, deserving recipient of this and now we're going to see him get it. The Railway and Locomotive Historical Society Gerald M. Best Senior Achievement Award. Not because he's a senior, because it is the most major award in railroad history. To be presented by James, by Bob Holsweiss, the president, to James Ehrenberger. Thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you all. I'll keep my remarks brief. Uh, one of the questions I always get asked by people is why? I and mean, we've heard a lot of reasons why Jim has gotten this award or has been, uh, this award's been bestowed upon him. 
But I want to talk about two things very quickly that make this award impactful. The first is the award itself. And I won't go through everyone who's received this award before, but I want to mention some names that might be familiar to you, I, sure, I certainly hope they are, who are previous recipients. And Jim, you are absolutely deserving to join this very distinguished group of authors and railway preservation experts. Jack White, Smithsonian Institution. William Edson, George Hilton, author. George Crambles, Herbert Harwood, uh, Doyle McCormick, James Beislein, Southern Steam Program, Arthur Dubin, Chronicler of Passenger Service, and Pullman specifically, George Hart and Robert Lewis, Bill Crackville, William Purdy. I could go on, Jim, but I hope you understand that you are entering or receiving an award that you have absolutely earned and that you are most deserving to join these distinguished folks as a recipient of. The award itself, I mean, excuse me, beyond that, Jim, I want to say something that Al mentioned and I want to emphasize it. You've done a lot of things, but one thing that you've done that elevates you to, a, to the next level is you've done the planning. How many times have I received a call from someone who said, my father, my brother, my friend, my uncle has passed away. I have a closet, a garage, a storage unit full of photographs, models, documents. I have no idea what it is. I have no idea what to do with it. If you don't come in a week, a month, two months, it's going in the garbage. Jim has done the heavy lifting. He has taken the time to document a lifetime of work, a lifetime of collecting, a lifetime of photography, and he has made it available to us. Jim's story is not about the book that would never be written. I'm sure we all know people like that. One day, I'm gonna write that book about X. Jim has done the writing. He has shared his work, very generously so. And that places him in that category of most worthy recipients of this award. Jim, on behalf of the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society, it is my distinct honor to present you with the Gerald M. Best Lifetime Achievement Award. Like 
Richard Kinbake, uh, Otto Perry, Gerald Best, uh, just, just any number of uh, top people in the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club. That, you know, we, we all, it, as you can tell, with this kind of group, it's a camaraderie with this railroad hobby and what we've done. And, and I, I really always have been pretty modest. I don't care to uh, toot my own horn. So I appreciate everything that Al did. And Robert, I, this is a wonderful, a wonderful honor for me to receive this. I told several that I would only say 25 words or less. I don't have to say anything. Al's already told you the secrets. And so that, that's what's taking place. However, it doesn't seem like it. It's over a period of 70 years. You can do a lot in 70 years, a little by little, and so on, and it accumulates. Kind of reminds me of that old time chief dispatcher. He, he knew how to intimidate us. And we would sometimes he'd show up in the morning after a sleepy night when he was on the night shift and you forgot to put down at the bottom of the train a PM or an AM and he tapped that train sheet. If you can't do the little things, how do you expect to accomplish the big things? And that's kind of the way life is. I, I look at it a lot like that. I, that's why I like to help people. That, that's always been my goal. I'm, I'm not in it for myself. I'm real happy to see everyone here, and my long time, the longest known friend that's here today is Gene Gross from Denver, Colorado, or Centennial, and we, we've been friends for 60 years, and her husband unfortunately couldn't go, he's sick, but Dave and I have been friends for 70 years. And this is typical of this rail fan and railroad history and railroad activities that we have. Other than that, I only have one other announcement, and I prefer really just to visit with you. One on one, I can hear better and so on, rather than having to get up and ask questions. But this evening, at 6.30 at the Albany restaurant, Caddy Corner from the people, I have reserved some space over there for those who are still in Cheyenne that wish to come. Uh, there's several out-of-towners that have indicated that they will be there. And uh, so at 6.30, we'll, we'll be over there. We'll, we'll continue this story. And again, thank you very much. Thank you, Ed and the Union Pacific. I couldn't have had it any better. Really couldn't have had it any better. This is a, a great opportunity to think that I, 71 years ago, I walked through this place. At that time, it was three shifts. We had hundreds of workmen here, right in this area, just a short ways over here. There's those huge wheel lanes, something that probably very few people here have ever seen one. This locomotive on the other side, 844, has 80-inch drivers. That wheel lane, you put one of those wheel sets in there, and it, it was impressive. I watched another time, they had an overhead crane, a 250-ton crane, a 3,900-class locomotive, Challenger, they picked it up on the other end of this shop when it was extended further, picked it up and moved it over into this area and set it down on a bay because they had additional work to do and that way they could alternate locomotives and they did that regularly. The last major shopping of the big boys 
was at the end of 1956. And at that time, they started cutting forces back, and we lost the ninth shift, and then eventually the other shifts. By 1959, when this locomotive last operated, I think it was July 21st, 1959, came from Laramie to Cheyenne. That was the end of regular steam operation on the Union Pacific. Since then, the Union Pacific, the only class one railroad in the United States that maintains a crew, the actual crew, the set of workmen who are here now keeping this equipment going. And they, they have two active steam locomotives, this 4014 and the 84, 844 now. So we, we, we are very happy and proud of the Union Pacific for doing that. No other railroad does that. Thank you again for coming, and I'll turn it back over to Ed, who has some announcements, and let's just visit and have a good time. Thank you very much, Jim. And I would also like to recognize all the friends that I have in the audience, Bob Fremmel, Barry Nordstrom, Gene Gross, John Bush, and everyone that I see, I look through and I see uh, Denise, Tom Klinger. Uh, it's just great seeing everyone here. So you're welcome to take uh, take your time and, and walk around a little bit. I uh, Just a reminder to be very careful, this is an active shop. Uh, the last 15 minutes before we cleaned up yesterday, Jimmy and John, my two boilermakers, who are working on the jacket and a few other things, have this entire area full of tools. And I just said, Let's just move them aside, sweep the floor, so we don't have to spend uh, more time on Monday putting it all back the way we need it to be. So we're proud that we can offer this shop, uh, make it available. As you mentioned, we're proud of the UP too. And on behalf of our CEO, Jim Vinna, our board of directors, all of our executive staff, we're honored that we can do this for you. So I'm proud to be here, and it's such a privilege to, to hear the story to hear all the details of the accomplishments and the preservation. Uh, that preservation that has a lot to do with why we do what we do here. So think about that for a minute. Here it is, the year 2024. We're not in a museum sitting, looking at, <coughs> looking, excuse me, looking at equipment that doesn't run. We're looking at a big boy that's gonna go out here in about two months. We're gonna travel around run about 7,000 miles. It'll be fun. It's a lot of hard work though. So with that, just take a few minutes. Uh, I'm happy to uh, entertain any questions you might have, uh, but uh, spend the time with Jim. Listen to his stories and talk to him. This is Jim's event. So we thank you again. Just a reminder, uh, another quick reminder, watch your step please as we walk around. Um, if it were a little, the weather were a little more favorable, we'd open the door. But you are welcome to walk around the front of the 4014 and walk around. Now, I'm going to set up some cones. We won't let you walk too far down that other ramp over there. But just be mindful of the metal walking surfaces. And this shop, that configuration over there, it goes back from 1957. Jim probably remembers when they, when they began making the improvements so they could service the diesel locomotives. So with that, I'll, I'd like to uh, conclude this event and thank you all for coming again. And uh, please don't hesitate to get some of those nice refreshments that Jim uh, got from Carson, Nebraska. Carson? Nebraska. Yeah, very good. All right, thank you very much, everybody. It's a pleasure and honor seeing everyone. Thank you.